Hi, everybody. Pastor Paul LaFontaine and Literal Life Church in Petersburg, Michigan, would like to invite you to take the next half hour and enjoy some time in the Word of God. If you're hungry for more of Christ, we believe you can be fed, and we pray that you'll be blessed. Visit our website for more information at literallife.church. May God bless you, my friend, and may the music and message encourage you today.
It's here in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 34. It says, And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Now this is a pretty stern word from the Lord, and if you, if you know the setting, this is speaking to the new generation, and it's speaking also to the generation that came out under a prophet, and they had acted so childish and dealt with the message so wrong that God says that generation, they're not even going to be able to go into the land. He says, the, 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 this, he called it an evil generation. I didn't, but it became evil. And these were people that had come under a prophet's message. But they became an evil generation, and they shall not see the good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he, he shall see it. And Caleb was old, so he's one of the old guys that got included. And to, see, to him will I give the land that, which, that he hath trodden upon, and to his children... Because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Now here's the distinction. An old man gets in out of the old generation for one thing. He's wholly followed me. In other words, you can't do this by being one foot in and one foot out. God knows that. You can't be second guessing the rest of your life. You got to be all in. And all that old generation, one day, one day they were in, one day they were out. If they ran out of food, they say, oh, we should have been back in Egypt. And they're up and down. You don't know where they stand from day to day. But there's some old guys like Caleb that said, I'm all in. I'm ready to go to my promise. So because he wholly followed the Lord, and it's just that simple. He was all in. I believe this thing 110%. I believe the promise of us going in land. I don't want to go there. So it's Caleb, you get included. And also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. Moses said, the Lord got angry with me, saying, thou also shall not go in. Moses said, God told me I can't even go in. The prophet can't even go in because of his anger. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which shall standeth, standeth before me, he shall go in thither, encourage him, for he shall ca cause Israel to inherit it. So the, the, the Holy Ghost ministry after the prophet's gone will be used, the Joshua ministry will be used to help encourage and bring the people into the land. Moreover, there's another class included, your little ones. The new generation, I'm including them. They get to go in. Praise be to God. Your little ones, which he said should be a prey. Remember back in Egypt and they ran out of water and they do that. And in front of their kids, they said, we should go back to Egypt. Our kids are going to be a prey to all the animals and they're all going to die. And, and they were complaining. That's what their fathers were saying. But God said, no, they're still here. And guess what? They get to go in and you don't. <laughs> Hate to be so stern about it, but that's what God's saying. Your little ones that you said would be destroyed in the wilderness, they weren't destroyed because I was watching over them. And guess what? I'm taking them into the promised land. By the way, they didn't earn anything, those kids, to get that place in the promised land. God's grace just said, I'll take them in. He said, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. Look at the children. They had no knowledge between good and evil. They shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Praise the Lord. Now, <clears throat> I want to add in Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews, Paul refers to this generation that God was grieved with. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 8. And throughout the Bible, God in Psalms, in Proverbs, all through the Bible, he refers to the fathers. Jesus referred to the Jews' fathers, your fathers. And most of the time it wasn't good. Your fathers. Because I want to talk about this morning, moving on from fathers who messed it up. That's my title. Moving on from fathers who messed it up because it keeps returning, referring to the fathers. The fathers did this. So the new generation had a challenge that they had to respect their fathers, but they could not move on to their promise unless they exited certain characteristics of their fathers. And Jesus was stern about it. He looked at the Jews and says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. 
I am the bread of life. I'm not a temporal blessing that you get. And then when you don't get it, oh, what happened? God, where's the manna? They ate off a of manna, but it's only a temporal blessing. This group shall not eat off a temporal blessing. They'll eat off the eternal bread of life. He said, harden not your hearts, verse 8, as in the provocation. That's from the word provoke, the people provoking God. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when the, your fathers tempted me. Your fathers, I want you to remember that term. Your fathers tempted me, proved me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, how do they do always err in their, where? There's something wrong with the heart. There's air in their heart, and they have not known my ways. This is a generation that could celebrate the works. They love the works of God, but they never learn the ways of God, his character. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Remember, that's not sin, smoking and drinking. That's unbelief. Unbelief hardens your heart. You start to disbelieve things of God and you start getting your heart hardened. Don't do that. Don't let your heart become hard. Your heart's supposed to be free. Can you say amen? But unbelief, if you keep holding on to it, will harden your heart. Don't let that happen. Take heed, brother, lest there be an evil, any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily what is called today, lest any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So I want to speak on the new generation a little bit. Last Sunday we talked about fathers and God being a father to you. I will be a father to you. But I do want to speak about the new generation in the relation to what they had to deal with in the, their fathers. And uh, you know, God always has his eye on the new generation. God does not hold the sins of the fathers on them, uh, but he gives them a chance to make it better. I know the scripture many of you thought of when I said that is that what about the scripture that says the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation? How many know that scripture? Some of you thought of that. When I said that God doesn't hold the sins of the father on the new generation, but he gives them a chance to make it better. I know the scripture that says the sins of the fathers. And actually, that scripture shows us the power of, a, 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 of the father's influence upon a life. That if the father's not right or does some things wrong, it has residual effects for many generations. Can you say amen? That's Bible now. It has the residual effects for many, many generations. And it shows how powerful the residual effect can be. The sins of the fathers can be visited. And that's why our family life in America is broke down today. That's why marriages are broke down today. Many times it goes back to men who lose their place. Men who lose, men who exit the home. Last Sunday we talked about God talking about the fatherless. He always was concerned about the fatherless. There's something about it that the fatherless, whether by, uh, whether by death or whether by exiting the home or whether not being the right kind of father or whether it's father's abusing the family or whether the father's provoking the children. How many know the Bible talks about that? There's several reasons why a child can be fatherless even when a father is physically in the home. And this has residual effects. I'm, I'm reading an article here that I will not comment too much about this morning because it's 27 pages, but I've been very moved by some of the statistics and the, 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 the emphasis this man, this professor gives 
about, he calls this article a world without fathers. And in the 1990s, he goes, goes back and does the statistics starting from the 1960s when we began with a lot of divorces. We, then the 70s and 80s, we got into a lot of unwed mothers. In other words, there was somebody who fathered them, but he, was ex, he wasn't a part of the family. So now you keep going to abuse and you keep going to women now that live on their own. And you've got many scenarios that remove the father. Actually, Hollywood uh, discredits the position of a father. Seemed like I should be having some more amens here this morning. This generation has had an attack on not only the families and the word of God, but the residual effect of that is to attack the fathers, that children, most of us did not grow up with a perfect father. Most of us grow up fatherless. Even if you had a good father, you're still spiritually fatherless because you haven't met your true heavenly father until you come back in contact with him. And he tells you, I will be a father to you. Glory be to God. Aren't you glad if you didn't have a good father this morning, he said, I will be a father to you. You'll be my children. I'll take you in my arms and I'll nurture you. Whatever you were missing, I'll provide through my fatherhood. Glory be to God. And so now this, I, I, like I said, I don't want to read much of it. The decline of fatherhood is one of the most basic, unexpected, and extraordinary social trends of our time. Its dimensions can be captured in a single statistic. In just three decades between 1960 and 1990, the percentage of children living apart from biological fathers more than doubled from 17% to 36%. By the turn of the century, nearly 50% of American children may be going to sleep each evening without being able to say good night to their dads. No one predicted this trend. Few researchers or government agencies have monitored it and is not widely discussed even today. But the decline of fatherhood is a major force behind many of the most many of the most disturbing problems that plague American society. Crime and delinquency, premature sexuality, out of wedlock births to teenagers, deteriorating educational achievement, depression, substance abuse, and alienation among adolescents and the growing number of women and children in poverty. And this is through research. This, many of these things came because a father wasn't present. The current generation of children and youth may be the first in our nation's history to be less well off psychologically, socially, economically, and morally than their parents were at the same age. The United States observed Senator Daniel Patrick he said may, may be, this may be the first society in history in which children are distinctly worse off than, their adult, than the adults. Even as this calamity unfolds, our cultural view of fatherhood itself is changing. Few people doubt the fundamental importance of mothers, but fathers? More and more the question of whether fathers are really necessary is being raised. Many would answer no and maybe not. And to the degree that fathers are still thought uh, and to the degree that, and to the to the degree that fathers are still thought necessary, fatherhood is said by many to be merely a social role that others can play. Mothers can play it. Partners, stepfathers, uncles and aunts, grandparents. Perhaps the script can even be rewritten and the whole role changed or dropped. This is the devil's work because when you re remove the true image of a father, you're re removing something that God created from the beginning, and every human being needs it or they feel insecure they have fears they can't approach life with security when the father's absent or they don't have a right father they were abused by their father there was a time in past when fatherlessness was far more common than it is today, but death was to blame. Back in the 17th century, they hit a time, and, and when we went through the wars, there was a lot of women, a lot of men were killed. So because of death, the fathers weren't present. But today, not divorce, desertion, out of wedlock births in early 17th century Virginia, only estimated 31% of white children reached 18 uh, with both parents still alive. That percentage climbed to 50% by the early 18th century to 72% 72, 72 by the turn of the present century and close to its current level by 1940. Today, well over 90% of Americans, youngsters reach 18 with two living parents. Almost all of today's fatherless children have fathers who are alive, well, and perfectly capable of shouldering the responsibilities of fatherhood. But they have exited for many reasons. 
They have exited. They're physically alive somewhere, but they're not being fathers. So, uh, you know, I could go on and on, but you, you can read these things. It's, it's called a world without fathers, and we live in a world without fathers. And so now I want to take the spiritual side today, but most of the generation, most of the generation has daddy issues, and that affects them. Most of our generation, including within the church, has daddy issues, sometimes unresolved from the past. And besides all the, the absent father, the dead father, the divorced father, the father that's alive but he won't come and see his children, then you have fathers living in the home that are not taking up their role as fathers. They're, 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 they're working, but they're not connected at all with their children, so you got that issue. So they're there, but they're not really there. Then you have abuse, which I have things that show the fruits from a father abusing the kids, whether physically or abusing the mom physically or abusing them mentally or abusing them economically where he's not providing. So you have that. And then let me bring up just one in the Bible that's not mentioned by this professor, and that is fathers who provoke their children to anger. This is detrimental. And God said in Ephesians, it says, fathers, don't provoke, don't stir up, don't do the things that make more anger in your children. Teach them, give them guidance, rebuke them, but love them, can you say amen? Give affection to them. But don't provoke them. And God says that. Because even when he's present provoking the children, this can have long-term effects by how the father acts. Is this okay with everybody? So, you know, going back to the scripture, the, the, it is true that the, the, if you bring up Exodus 25, we have that scripture because some of you maybe thought of it. The iniquities of the fathers and sins of the fathers have built is, is trickles down to the, the, uh, the children, to the third and fourth generation. I want to just clarify it, though, because Exodus 20 and verse 5, if you guys have that back there, we'll just read it. I didn't have it here. Exodus 20 and verse 5. Let's see if that's the one. And thou shalt not bow thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, that's that. Let's skip to Exodus 34 and 7 and see how it's worded. Exodus 34 and 7. So these are saying that just because you're a third and fourth generation doesn't mean you get a free pass. The sins of the fathers can be visited upon you. How many has ever known people that they can't stand their father, but they start acting like him and they start abusing their children. Yeah, the power of effect. I don't want to do that. I hate that. And they start doing it themselves. They start treating their children the same way. Because see, without the Holy Ghost, without a power, the life of Jesus Christ in you, there's nothing to break that. But thankfully for the blood of Jesus Christ, there's something that can break the curse. This is, but look how it's worded here. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So in other words, he's a loving father. He's, he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, upon the, unto the third and fourth generation. It says it again, but it's it's. Pre- it's, it's, it's the first thing he says is that God is a merciful God. He forgives iniquity. So when, when the new generation can come to God and say, God, forgive me, let me not continue this. God forgives the iniquity of the fathers and doesn't visit it upon the children. God's mercy is the answer. Can you say amen? In other words, mercy and forgiveness has the power to break curses. I'm going to say it again, as simple as it is. You were looking for a great revelation this morning and a great thing. Here's a revelation for you. Take a hold of it. Can you say amen? That, that, that mercy and forgiveness, true mercy and forgiveness with God and with fathers and with parents has the power to break curses. If you go to the mercy and forgiveness of the Father, it can break curses. Generational curses are broken by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gener- I don't care how deep it is. I don't care how bad it is. Generational curses are broken by the blood of Jesus Christ. God dwells in, in a realm of motives and intents. 
The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any sword and deserves the thoughts and intents of the heart, the motives, the intents, the deeper part. Why am I doing this? Why do I have such nervousness? It may be for other reasons. Why am I feeling insecure my whole life? Why am I fearful all the time? And you have to go deep within yourself. God, reveal it to me so that something deep down there, the motive, the intent is just this thing that keeps irritating me and making me emotionally unstable for life. Go to the core and go with God and say, God, reveal it to me. And if something has been done in the past that is affecting me, I need to find the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, you've forgiven me, but I need more of the power of the cross. I need it to help my anxiety. Can I get an amen this morning? I need more than just to know I'm forgiven, and that's good, but I need the power to relieve me of past anxiety, that I can be what I was supposed to be, and that's free. Free in my heart, free in my mind. And then when I come up against it again, because we can be set free, and the devil's got something for us, something else tomorrow for us. Because he don't want you free. So something else pops up. And this way you have the courage to say, the same God that delivered me yesterday is the same God can help me today. And Christ can come and change impossible things. I'd love to be around more and more a group of people. And we have some sitting here this morning. The curses of their fathers have been broken from their lives. They live in victory. They, they come from a divorced home. They come from a father that didn't do it right. But they're living in victory as a Christian because it's not a death. It's not a death sentence on their life. God brought life to them. And I can live with joy about the future. I'm moving on. Can you say amen? I'm moving on. This word is taking me somewhere. I'm not bound to the pulpit. I'm not bound to the pulpit. This word says I can move on. Even when I'm getting wore out, I can still keep running because I'm excited the word is taking me somewhere for watching our message today. If you would like more information, please contact us by visiting our website, literallife.church. And if you would like to come and visit us in person, consider this your personal invitation. We're just 15 minutes north of Toledo at 11,100 Summerfield Road in Petersburg, Michigan. God bless you, my friend, and have a blessed day.